Hi, good afternoon. Welcome back to the execution stream for the afternoon. Um, I hope you had a great break. Uh, my name is Catherine and I'll be facilitating the rest of the afternoon. So you won't be able to get rid of me until the end of the day. Um, I'd love to introduce to you our first speaker for the execution stream this afternoon. Um, he's currently the principal engineer at Shine Solutions and he has 20 years of experience in the industry. He's very passionate about open source projects. Um, please give a warm welcome to Clefano Subagio. Hi, Clefano, how's it going? Hi, Catherine. Good, thank you. Um, How are you doing? Great. Um, so Clefano is joining us from Melbourne today. Um, and he's going to be talking about the Open API Generator. Um, this is a very popular tool on GitHub. It has close to 10,000 stars um, and it has various functionalities that uh, Clefano is going to talk us through today. Um, so I'm very excited for this talk. If you have any questions, please post it in the Q&A chat and I will um, ask these after, after the talk. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation on Open API Generator, which is a library that I think is the, the babel fish of the API world. Um, some of you might not know what a babel fish exactly is. Um, I'll walk you through it a bit later. So uh, to start with, my name is Clefano Subagio. I'm a principal engineer at Shine Solutions, and I'm also a member of um, OpenAPA Generator Technical Committee. So that's just a fancy way of saying that I'm a contributor. Um, th there are a number of um, amazing individuals who are part of the core team, um, and, and they're, they're the ones that really um, build a lot of the effort on, on the project. So today's agenda, on today's agenda, um, we will start with talking about um, the polyglot systems and the Babel fish. And then I'll introduce the open API generator library and a bit about the project as well. And then we'll move on to the um, my use case scenarios, how I have been using open API generator throughout the years across different types of projects. And then to close it off, um, we'll wrap up and um, I'll open up an invite to for everyone to have a look at the project and hopefully some of you might be interested in contributing back to the project. So um, the first one, the polyglot systems and the Babel fish. So the my, my journey of um, API work and thinking about uh, how application communicate to each other, like it all started long time ago, back in, um, in the year in the 2000s. Um, back then, I was a Java developer, and a lot of what I worked on back then, um, they were mostly around monolithic J2EE applications. So some of you uh, might remember back in the days, um, the in enterprise Java bin, EJB, so those were the days. And back then, in the Java community, th th there was this mindset that um, obviously not everyone, but a lot of uh, members of the commu community um, thought about um, having 100% pure Java approach for everything. So if you're working on the server side, on the back end, Java, you're um, writing a database driver to connect to various database systems, right? So right in Java, uh, mobile phone back then, 20 years ago, um, Java again. So um, that, that was really um, the, the mindset um, of uh, a lot of people in the community. And if I can illustrate what a monolithic Java application looks like, and this is an oversimplification, it's really just a rectangle. That's your monolithic application. Everything is written in Java inside there. So um, that, that was back then. Um, and then fast forward 10 years ago, uh, 10, 10 years later, uh, I, I went to a talk at Yao conference in 2012. And th there were a couple of talks by a gentleman named Fred George, which really um, opened my eyes 
and uh, remember, like nowadays, microservices are common. Um, people write lambda functions, cloud functions, right, uh, from various cloud providers. But back then, it was still really the uh, early days of um, microservices. Service-oriented architecture was there. But, um, but so back then, Fred George talked about microservices architecture. And one thing I really like about it is how he presented that those services should be language agnostic. Um, it, it didn't really matter um, what languages it should be written for this should be used for the services as long as it is the right language for the job or it is the right language for the team. So the, there is reasoning and it could be multiple uh, multitude of languages. And then the second talk that he gave was a bit more controversial. Um, it was titled The Programmer Anarchy. So this is more about um, allowing the developer to decide on what language that they could use for the service that they wrote. So um, a, a project, an example project that um, Fred put forward um, gave the example that the, the project uses, used to use um, Ruby, a mix of Ruby, Clojure, C++, and Node.js. So it was really a mix. And he justified that, that it was successful as long as the business values also delivered. And, those two were great talks and they are available on YouTube if uh, any of you would like to um, have a look now in 2021. So th these talks really um, opened my eyes. And if I try to illustrate that, th this becomes a bit, a bit more like this. Again, this is an oversimplification, just an example. So imagine there are a set of services on the left side, uh, one application that use a mix of Java, Ruby, Clojure, and Python. And then there is another application on the right side that uses um, Node.js, Go, and .NET. Like it's really a mix. And those services talk to one another uh, within each application, and the two applications talk to each other. So that's um, opening up the possibility of um, Python and Node.js to talk to each other. So that really made me think um, if they're using different languages. So even though the payload and the protocols are the same, um, the, the downside is that um, you then have to write a piece of code for each language for these services that use that language so that they know how to process the payload. And I couldn't help but thinking that it was really very similar to the Babel fish situation. Um, I don't know how many of you would be uh, familiar with this uh, movie. So uh, the screenshots are from the remake of the movie, not the original one from the late 70s. Um, so on the left side there, that's the Babel fish. And how do you use it? You stick it in your ear, and then you can um, understand alien languages. So um, to illustrate it a bit better, um, so once the Babel fish is inside your ear, you can instantly understand anything sent to you in any language. So that's a bit similar. So there's a payload coming in. It could be sound wave. It could be a JSON payload. And then the Babel fish translated for into the language that you understand. So um, <clears throat> so again, if, if we map it back to the multi-services example uh, put before, it is as if you want to put a Babel face and stick it into each service's ear. Um, and it helps them to then consume the data payload into the language is, which is being used by the service. So so th that was the, the problem set that I was thinking. And um, in the early days when um, I started using this uh, multi-services approach, um, it's arguable whether it, it was microservices. Um, some would say it should be called nano services. Um, um, the problem is still there. Right? How, how do you manage this uh, multi language support um, in a nicer way? Right. So I was looking around for some solution, and I found a project. So form it, um, Open API Generator was formerly known as Swagger Code Gen, and that was the the library that I, I used back then and I contributed to um, at the very beginning. So 
what is open api generator it is it is um, it is an open source project and it's a code generator library um, this open api generator itself is written in java and it uses um, mustache templates to form each of the generator so for example if it is a Python API client, then you have a set of templates to form this Python API client project. And then um, this generator is mostly used for generating API clients, um, server stops, and documentations. Uh, as of now, the project supports 40 plus technology stacks. So that's really a lot of um, popular technology stacks covered um, by the project. And the history was that it started as a Swagger Code Gen project. And some years uh, ago, um, the, co the top contributors decided to create a community fork of the project and call it um, Open API Generator. I wouldn't go into the details and reasoning why. Um, the website has um, a more detailed explanation of why um, the, the community fork happened. And um, it has almost 10,000 GitHub stars and almost 2,000 contributors um, after all these years. So how does it work? It's really simple. You start with an open API specification and treat it as the input for open API generator library. And then it produces the API clients, um, API servers, and documentations. It's really uh, simple input, and then you get an output. The open API specification itself is parsed using Swagger parser. So that's used to um, parse the specification from version two and version three, and then translate them into objects, which then gets passed to the generator templates in mustache format. And then um, they're used to then produce the clients and servers and documentations. Let, let's have, let's go to an example. So there is a service um, on the internet called IPFI. It's really simple. So I'm just picking up a really simple example to illustrate how um, this can uh, work. So it, the host is at api.ipfi.org. And the way it works is really simple. So you send a get HTTP request, and then um, you have the, you pass in the JSON format as the query string, and then uh, at the root path, and then the service will respond with 200 OK, and then a payload, a JSON payload with an IP property, and then the value is the, the public IP address of your um, connection. So it's real simple. So I turned that IP5 service into an open API specification. So there was a talk on open API um, yesterday, so I wouldn't go into that much details on, on this slide. So basically, the specification allows you to specify some metadata, the, the open API version, the information about this specification, who's the author, um, who, what's the contact details, right? And, um, and also to define the, the servers. So in this case, it is an api.ipfi.org. And then you can specify the path. And because it only has one endpoint, then, then you can specify the path get. It is a get method at the root path. And uh, I give it operation ID get IP. And then you can define the parameters. So it, this is where you define the, the format query string. Um, you specify that it is of type string. And the value is an enum. It can be a JSON or JSONP. And um, it's, a, it's not a required property. So um, the, it, it will default to JSON. And then you can also define the responses. So with the responses um, here, uh, I defined that it can use, um, it, it responds with um, code 200, OK? And then um, as the response payload, you specify the schema. And here, the schema, you can define as a, an IP schema. It's like a data modeling. And then <clears throat> you specify uh, that the schema has a, an IP property of type string. So the value should be string. And this IP property is a required parameter for this data model. So this specification defines that single endpoint that IP5 service provides. 
Now, um, how do we run this generator? So imagine you have that API specification and then you save it as a file called specification.yaml. Um, th there are many ways to do it. I'm going to show you um, the four simple way to um, run the generator, the open API generator against that um, schema, the, the specification. So you can use the you can use Java, just download the jar file from the website, and then um, you use the generate command, and then you specify the input specification as one of the argument, um, and then specify the generator name that we want to use. In this example, uh, use Python, and then for the output, just specify the location where the generated code should be located. Um, so Java is one option. You can use um, npm in install, use an npm package, um, and then um, you can pass the exact same generator and the same commands as well. If you're on a Mac, um, you can use Homebrew and um, use Brew install, open API generator. And for those who like to run um, using the containers, then you, you, there's also a Docker image that you can download and use. So th those are the uh, popular way of um, generating the, the code. So what will be generated from Open API Generator? So basically, you will get a project structure. And then it has some metadata. And then um, it also produces a readme file with some information, some documentation on how to use it, uh, about the project itself. Um, there's a CI config. Um, many of the generators produce a Travis CI config, but it's not mandatory. It's something you can um, replace or just remove. Um, and then it also defines the library dependencies. Um, just imagine if, if you need to support multiple languages, there, there are so many libraries that you can use across multiple technology stacks. And um, many of them would have yeah, different libraries, dependencies, sub-dependencies. And that's a lot that already taken care of by OpenAPI Generator. And then um, you have um, some documentation generated as well. And then unit tests. So even though some people did argue that, why well, well, would you generate the unit tests if you already generate the, the actual application code itself? So it, it is still useful. Um, it can, it can uh, help you with um, catching up uh, any potential bug um, or um, running running the, the code against um, different environments as well. So um, it, it still provides value. So for the API client, it generates the clients and the data models, the, the classes usually across multiple languages. And then for the API server stops, uh, you get the endpoints, controllers, and the payloads. So to, to, get, to give you a further idea on um, how many files get generated, so these are this is, these three columns provide uh, examples for Python, Ruby, and Node.js. So when you generate, when you use Open API Generator using Python, Ruby, and Node.js um, generators, then you get these files immediately out of the box that um, gives you the ability to then just use the service natively using the programming language that and technology stack that, that you want to use. Um, just for fun, uh, some of you might be able to guess um, this many files will be generated by which generator. And yes, um, you guess it right if you said it's um, Java. Um, now, here's an example Ruby API client. Um, again, for with the API service, it's really simple. How can we um, execute the get IP operation using Ruby? So at first, you just require open API client. It, it's just a name that gets used to generate the, the client um, so, um, um, library itself within Ruby. And then you create an instance of that API. And then you execute the get underscore IP method. So this name get underscore IP is um, derived from the operation ID get IP. And then you pass in the payload that it, it is um, a JSON format, and then you get the result. The result itself is the, it contains the, the data model that you define earlier on in the specification. So you can access the IP property of the result. And if there is any error, then you can just wrap the, the get IP call inside a begin rescue block. 
So remember in the open API specification, um, we define that if the response is 200, then you get this data model. But if it is not 200, then it can be considered as an error. And open API generator also provides the error um, handling and the error project, uh, the error object. And um, it will naturally um, give you that API error if um, the response is not 200 as expected, or if it is not anything that's not defined within the specification. And what are these supported te technology stacks? Uh, there are definitely a lot. Um, the, the popular ones um, are definitely supported. Um, I'm just putting up the logos here. And there are definitely so many of them. And some new ones are being added as well. So a lot of the popular ones, popular programming languages, popular technologies, they are definitely there. And if there is one that you don't see, it's probably an opportunity for you to contribute another generator. Now, um, what are my use case scenarios out of all this? The, um, the very first project that I did, it was an ESB enterprise service bus with a lot of services. They're mostly Java, but um, there was a one or two Pythons in the picture. And um, instead of um, writing the interaction to the ESB one by one on each service, we used OpenAPI generator or Swagger code gen back then to um, generate the API clients and define the ESB um, as a specification. And then a, a second example, we have the SDK clients for uh, REST API. So there is an API gateway, which uses open API to define the um, API endpoints. And then we expose this API gateway to consumers and the consumers ended up using different technology sets, right? Node.js, Python, Go, and Java in this example. So, um, Again, we just used Open API Generator to create the SDK clients and then pass this SDK clients to um, the consumer of this service, um, this API gateway endpoint. Um, another, one unconventional example here uh, where we use Open API Generator was um, to manage, a, we, we work with a legacy enterprise application that uh, notoriously known to take three days to provision. So we want to bring it to um, to the modern world and um, to have a bit of uh, infrastructure as code to provision this application. So we wrote a CLI in Node.js and again, to interact with the application, um, it is, uh, we define the open API generator a client. Uh, and then we write a Ruby API client generated um, from um, open API generator as well. And that Ruby API client is used by Puppet module for provisioning a number of resources within the application. And also um, we use inspect profile for checking compliance um, against certain standards. Um, and so this is like checking if the application is configured securely based on certain uh, security standard. So again, the Ruby API client is generated using open API generator. Um, same thing, Python API client, um, there are some parts of the automation that requires an Ansible playbook. Uh, Ansible is Python based, so we use the Python API client. Um, and then same thing with this, another Spring Boot application that we use for um, orchestrating the components within the application. Um, another unconventional example, we actually ran performance testings uh, using JMeter and out of the specification, you can actually use Open API generator to generate the JMeter JMX file and a CSV template to um, populate, which allows you to then populate the various test scenarios. So this really uh, simplifies the test planning, it saves a lot of time as well. Um, on the open source side, uh, Jenkins CI CD, um, I created a library called Swaggy Jenkins, um, heavily using uh, open API generators as well. And it's used as the base for writing a command line interface, some smart light notifiers. You know, if there is a build failure, um, show red. Uh, if there's a uh, no failure, then show green. Um, and also for this application, so um, we set up a cloud function again, and also dialog flow, which then allows you to trigger a build Jen on Jenkins using voice um, input as an input. So everything goes through you know, Sergey Jenkins as the um, library in front of um, Jenkins endpoints. 
um, after maintaining a number of um, services and applications and using Open API Generator extensively throughout the years, um, my top three maintenance tips are still like you should have integration testing. That, that's um, really uh, unquestionable. And then number two and number three are still integration testing. Um, you would say this is a software engineering 101, but integration testing is really, really critical for um, uh, using these clients because, and why the, the, the reason is because changes happen all the time. Um, I've gone through open API specification chains from version two to version three. Um, and then open API generator itself uh, is evolving from two, three, four, five, um, Python from Python to Python three, Ruby, um, the, the, the switch from Ruby 1.9 to Ruby 1.2.3 was quite painful and it's helpful from having integration testing that um, you, you can verify that all the changes are still working or what's broken and then let's fix them, right? Um, the application itself is changing. There are new features, you know, changes to the endpoint uh, payloads and it's just um, necessary and you have to test them. Dependency vulnerabilities, right? So security um, vulnerabilities are just everywhere nowadays. You, you need to update your dependencies every so often and you definitely have to go through um, running run the integration testing to pick up the updated dependencies and the making sure that they are still working. And then environment changes again, like whether you use Lambda function or uh, for example, Lambda initially, AWS Lambda decided to retire um, Python 2, right? So you have to move to Python 3. So you, sh you still have to verify that as well. Um, and then to close it off, um, so you remember the Babel fish example I put forward uh, earlier on. So we need one fish and stick it into its service using a particular technology stack or a programming language. So that, that's where you can use Open API Generator and um, generate the client and stick it into the service here. And then um, the payload will be understood by the application of the service immediately. Um, so the Open API Generator, the website is there, openapigenerator.tech. Um, I hope this um, quick talk um, can provide you with the various benefits of um, the project itself. It, it's a multi-technology stack support is just amazing. If you have so many programming languages or stack in, within your ecosystem, you need this tool. And then you get all the boilerplate, the boilerplate code for free, really. And it's a massive time saver. You start with so many um, code uh, from the beginning. Uh, my first contribution to the project, um, I really optimized file downloading in Ruby API client. Um, I hit a problem where um, the memory is maxed out at two gigabyte when I try to download a large file within the generated code. And, um, and I optimized that so that it it just use um, 100 megabyte um, of memory, and th that doesn't mix up the two gigabyte Ruby memory. And then um, the client can just download any size uh, of uh, files everywhere. So yeah, your contribution are welcome. Hopefully you can um, help us with um, all, all the project. Thank you. And um, if there are any question, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, thank you so much, Clefano. That was a very insightful talk. I've definitely learned a lot more about what a open API generator does. And thank you for sharing those use cases. Um, I think we don't have too much time for questions. I just want to ask you um, if people have any other um, questions for you, what's the best way to contact and connect with you? Oh yeah, so I'm uh, my username is Clifano on LinkedIn, um, on Twitter, um, and I can be reached out on email cliff.subaja at shinesolutions.com. More than happy, and I'll hang around on the chat as well, um, and anyone can reach me on the um, website chat. Yeah. Awesome, thank you so much.